BMQ, we've grown our range to over 2,000 plants. And we take pride in the quality of each and every one. Because we know what it means to be plant proud. From our safe hands to your green fingers, we've got everything you need for brighter days. So bring on the fresh soil and muddy knees. With over 2,000 plants at B&Q, we will grow again. Hello and welcome to the first session of Gardening Made Easy, sponsored by B&Q. Hello there, my name is Alice Vincent and I am a gardening columnist here at The Telegraph. I'm an author and a self-taught garden, and I gardened on balconies and in community spaces for six years before getting an actual gardening. And as a result, I firmly believe that you can grow in any space, no matter your experience or how big it is. This session is Patio Gardening SOS, and over the next 45 minutes, I will be showing you how to get your outdoor space looking spring, summer ready with minimum effort no matter what size space you've got available to you. It's a session aimed at beginners and building your confidence. Today, I'm joining you from my garden in South London. So please do bear with any planes that might be flying over or other people enjoying the sunshine, but hopefully you'll still be able to hear me nice and clearly. In a bit, I'm going to be showing you how to pot up a container that will bring you color and interest until autumn. And there are gonna be some basic rules and ways to follow that that you can apply to all the containers on your patio. Hopefully that will give you some hands-on uh, guidance. But first I wanted to address some of the questions that you've sent through because um, I was really excited by them and I thought it might be a good way to start. I was really pleased to see that several questions came in about having north facing and shady gardens because that is exactly what I've got here. So um, this garden is north facing and depending on the time of the year, it's often, often in shade. So um, as you can see now, the sun is pretty much everywhere but right here and um, and that means the patio as well is in shade. If you're in a situation where you might be thinking about landscaping your garden or making a few changes, I'd urge you to think about where the sun comes in what time of the day before you start deciding where to put a patio. Um, it seems like so many are put either next to the house, which make, please excuse the sirens, we are, we are in Brixton, um, we're in the middle of the city. So yeah, patio is often a place right next to the house, which makes a lot of sense in terms of taking your lunch out there or having a coffee, but that also means that they're sometimes in shade. So if you've got the opportunity to build a patio from scratch, think about the spot where the sun hits at the time of day when you're going to want to be there. But if you are, like me, stuck with a shady patio in a funny corner of the garden, no worries, you can still make it look beautiful even if you don't have direct sunlight when you want it to. So someone has asked me what are the best kinds of containers to use in a north-facing garden which doesn't get much height, much sun until the height of summer. And I totally feel you, this is the situation I've got. And the thing with containers is that there are loads of them, right? So you can have terracotta which I've got a lot of here um, I've also got some vintage metal containers here which kind of reclaim you can have containers made out of wood um, obviously you can have plastic ones as well and depending on your needs and what you would like to plant in there and what your aesthetic tastes are they can offer different things and actually I've written a column about this which will be coming out in a couple of weeks so um, keep an eye on the Telegraph gardening page for a full container rundown until then though what I would say the most important thing with containers rather than anything else is size the bigger the container the less likely your plants are to die there's a few reasons for this mostly it's water retention so the biggest challenge to growing your plants in containers is that they depend on the soil inside that container for everything nutrients water you know support and space all of that and so you need to um the more that you give that plant in terms of container space the happier it's going to be the larger it's going to grow and you won't have to pot it on that quickly uh rather than you know sometimes you have containers and we feel like we're changing in and out constantly 
the bigger the containers, the less you have to do that. Also, as you can see with this one behind me, you can also plant multiple plants in that will keep interest going all season round. So I planted this in October. In the centre, we've got hellebores, which over winter, when everything else is quiet, were beautiful. They were bright white, totally gorgeous. Also got some ferns, which you'll be hearing me talk about a lot today because I love ferns, especially if you've got challenging growing spaces. And I also put in some spring bulbs, which you can see tulips, muscari, some narcissus, one of which is still hanging on because we've had such a cold April. Um, so these have been layered in this pot, which means that this is still going to look good in the summer when the ferns come through and the bulbs die back. And I'll get on to what you do with your bulbs in just a minute. And, um, and then when we come round to autumn again, these hellebores are going to take over the show and start blooming. That is a whole year's worth of planting in one container. And we're going to go through that when I demo. But yeah, so if you've got that challenging growing space, just make sure you've got the biggest containers you can get. If that means you have just one big bed, raised bed, fine. If it means you have three big containers, great. But the biggest ones you can afford and that you can accommodate will mean that you can get more colour in. As for... Um, with regards to north facing, I think, you know, north facing is one of those phrases that people instantly uh, <laughs> get a bit horrified at with regards to a garden. But the thing is, you can have a south facing garden that's very overlooked by your neighbours or by woodland or by trees. Um, often the aspect isn't is to be considered as important as what is overlooking your space um so while this garden is north facing and we are definitely built up here they also the plants get a lot of light from the top down because there's not really that much in the way of trees that makes a huge difference in terms of what you can grow as you can see i've got quite a lot in flower here um, so don't think that a north facing space is a is a total no-no for growing things um, I'm going to talk about shade a second and then I can see your questions are coming in and um, about hot spaces, which can be, in my opinion, worse than shady ones. So I'll get onto those as well. Just before the, while we're talking about shade and north facing gardens, a few of you have asked what to grow if your patio is shaded. And I'm so pleased this question has come up because um, I shade garden a lot now. You can see that we're, we're in shade, but also for three years I gardened on a shady woodland balcony which was gorgeous, but you know, you looked out and all you could see was trees and I got very familiar with the bird life. But um, obviously it's challenging growing conditions and it was a beautiful education in shade planting and I'd love to share my enthusiasm for shade planting. Once you've kind of tackled those expectations of how much colour you can expect from your plot, you enter into this amazing world of leafy, luscious goodness. You know, we're talking ferns, hostas, ivy has got some here uh woodland plants glossy green creepers um i have an instagram account called nauticulture and that is essentially just one big fan account of shade planting because it's the way i've gardened for the for most of my gardening journey and there's lots of ideas as to what you can grow there um they're not in shot right now but i've got some shade planters tucked next to my back door where there is very little light we had someone pop up uh, talking about the um the spot by their back door being very kind of sheltered and they are green all year round even when it's snowing they are green so i've got uh what's known as mind your own business that you know the kind of green creeper which in containers is actually a godsend because it allows bigger plants to grow through but it also covers really beautifully all year round I've got some ferns, I've got some hostas, I've got some persicaria to add height. And as the year goes on, obviously it grows up and it backs down, but it always stays green and it is a beautiful thing to come out of the back door to. Um, you can also stick bulbs in. So just because you're north facing or you're having shade doesn't mean bulbs won't work. In fact, the beautiful thing about bulbs is that they frequently, they'll come up at the time when the light is really low and they're not competing with that tree canopy for light. So woodland anemones, tulips narcissus muscari have a play and see what you see what you're after but if you stick to woodland excuse the sirens woodland plants you'll be on to a winner because all of those thrive in low light conditions to recap if you've got a pen and paper to hand and you're wanting to know what to plant in shady spaces here are some plants for you origeran astrantia hostas i'll get onto slugs in a minute hellebores fatia japonica euphorbias hardy geraniums, po foxgloves, pulmonarias, 
honestly, there are so many things. Just look for the shade section, um, whether on the RHS website or, um, you know, people like Beth Chateau have written extensively about shade gardening. Certain nurseries have plants for shady areas as well and lean into that space. Trust you, it's a really, really great space to get into. I'm going to answer some of the questions that you've been sending in now. Um, lots of questions on pests and ants. Um, okay, we're gonna get on to talking about what soil we put into our containers as well. Um, okay, let's, let's get on to dahlias because actually now is the time that if you've got tubers, um, if you're thinking about growing dahlias, you can pick up tubers now and it's a good time to pop them on. So all of my dahlia tubers are currently sitting in plastic pots in my living room where it is very sunny. You can grow dahlias in, tube, in pots as long as you have quite a lot of sun. Um, in fact, someone popped up saying that they've got a very sunny south facing terrace and dahlias would be great for you, Razor. Um, like they, they're from Mexico originally and Central America and they love that heat and that sun. What I would say with dahlias, find the varieties that are container friendly. A lot of websites that specialize in dahlias will tell you if they are or not. Um, Bishop of Canterbury comes to mind. That's a variety that is really good for containers. And again, as I'm saying, bigger is better. Get the biggest pot you can. And these are hungry plants, dahlias. They, anything that flowers prolifically, so sweet peas, dahlias, other summer plants are hungry because they need a lot of energy to produce those beautiful flowers. So put some really good quality compost in there, get some um, ideally some well rotted manure or some organic compost in and keep them um, ideally quite well watered until they get established as well. So I was going to, um, and yeah, I, Joanne, I'll come on to your full sun patio as well. Um, Full sun, so Joanne says, our patio is in full sun and it gets so hot, plants end up even dying in containers. What are the best plants and containers for this? And this collides with a question that I had in before about what are the best plants for minimum watering? And I think this is a really important point. You know, anyone who's been outdoors in the UK for the last few years will have noticed how scorching our summers are getting. And that means that we have to adapt how we garden because, you know, it's really not ideal to be using the hose all the time, both in terms of, you know, everyone's busy, got better things to be doing, but also from a sustainability point of view, it's better for us to adapt to what's happening in our surroundings than try and, you know, continue to water as much as we possibly can. And that means we have to adapt what we grow. And so what I would say is that we need, if you're finding that things are drying out and getting very baked, have a look at some drought resistant planting. So look at kind of plants and schemes that maybe hail from, you know, such as Mediterranean regions, um, hotter parts of the world. There are some incredible South African plants that flourish in drought tolerant conditions, even to the extent of things like succulents, which obviously are from um, more desert areas and hotter Central Americas um, and deep South of America. And, and those are brilliant because they actively are really well adapted to not having a lot of um, water. So things like sedums, which actually I've got a couple of here and are amazingly tolerant. I love sedums and they are a plant that looks, they're coming up now and they look interesting. They will grow over summer and then in autumn they turn really beautiful colours. They flower, the bees love them um, and they can thrive on quite low water. But also things like olive trees, grasses, prairie plants, pelargoniums, all of these plants hail from hotter places and they'll put up with um, less water. If you're wanting to think about how you can maximise the survival of these plants in containers, um, some people would say to be wary of using terracotta planters, which are like terracotta is a porous material, so it dries out quicker. Now this is a, also why it makes it really good for it because um, because it means it won't get waterlogged. And I really like the look of contain of terracotta containers. Um, but you might find that going opting for stone or a composite container um, is a better option. You can also get water retenting uh, capsules in and add those to your compost. And I'd also say watch how you're watering. So it's very tempting to kind of go around every evening with the hose splashing water about, but it really will only hydrate that top inch or so of soil. If you give something a really, really good drink when you're establishing it in the plot, 
pot that will encourage its roots to grow. And we're talking, you know, putting on a hose on very low for an afternoon when you plant something in, especially in a bed, in a container, probably a couple of hours or so. But that will, that's that slow trickle will encourage the plant to bed in really well. And that will give it more survival for the long run. Um, and again, when you're watering, do one big water less often rather than a little bit here and there. You need to get that water all the way down to the roots and that's how it will thrive. Um, so I think, I'm loving all of these questions, um, but I think it's probably time to do a little bit uh, of a potting session. It might seem really simple, you know, you've all got patios, you've all got containers, um, but we've got a lot of questions about, you know, the length of keeping things floriferous and beautiful for and that's why doing something like this pardon the siren um can be done even at this time of year you can do it all year round and so um i'm going to crack on with that now what we're going to be planting be uh, setting up here um what we're going to be planting up is uh, some agapanthus and um, topping that some annuals and then bedding in some bulbs as well. So what I've got here is, this is about a 35 centimetre terracotta pot, probably one of the most cheapest bulk standard uh, non-plastic pots you can get. I like them because they're porous and crucially, it's got a hole at the bottom. So this is really, really important. Whatever you're planting in, make sure that it has sufficient drainage. If your plant pot doesn't have drainage, what happens is the roots don't have anywhere to let go of that water. The roots rot. If the roots rot, your plant can't recover. You know, often after a frost or something, it might look like your plant has been scuppered. But um, actually, if the roots are still oxygenating, if they're still bringing in food and water and nutrients, then it should probably bounce back. You might hear a bit of a clinking noise, and that's because I want to talk about crops. So these are, this is a actually quite a nice pot that a squirrel knocked off a window ledge. Um, and as a result, we have crops. Now, some gardeners like to use them, some don't. What it does do is it slows down that trickle of water to the hole. So it stops the hole in the bottom being bunged up by soil, and it also slows down that trickle of water. So, um, if, you're, uh, if you are having problems with plants drying out, putting in crocs at the bottom of your pot is a good idea. Um, today I'm not going to, <laughs> because these are um, actually really good squirrel defences. I have a real problem with squirrels here, digging things up, and I pop these on top of my pots, which is quite an attractive way of keeping them off. So, potting mix. Someone asked here about uh, topsoil, and... Um, uh, and, and whether it was the wrong thing. People get very, like the soil, soil is an amazing and magical world and it is really to be respected. Topsoil is a really precious resource, but if you've ended up with it, that's okay. The main thing I want to get across today is the importance of using soil without peat. Um, so peat is uh, the closest thing the UK has, I'm gonna start potting while I talk, Peat is the closest thing we have to rainforests here in the UK. They're a huge store of carbon. And um, for a good while, the horticultural industry has been using peat to plant things in. But the fact is, um, you don't need it for your plants to succeed. There's lots of other plant matter you can use. And so I'm an organic gardener, and that means I don't use peat. I don't use pesticides. Um, and I only use plant-based chemicals in what I grow. And often when we're talking about um, defense against pests, someone is asking a lot about ants on here. Um, when we're talking a lot about pests, it's often prevention rather than cure in terms of gardening. So if you find you're having a lot of slug problems, you're having ant problems, you're having vine weevil problems, or I will get onto that, um, pests will attack a plant that seems vulnerable. And often one of the best ways of making sure that your plant isn't too vulnerable is setting it up in the, with really good compost, really good potting mixture from the off. So get these few stages right here, you'll end up with a much healthier, happier plant. The pests are more, less likely to attack in comparison to that rather sadder one next door. Um, so I'm using peat-free compost. This is New Horizons. I also like Dalefoot and Silvergrow. You can buy peat-free compost um, 
from places like B and Q um, and from good garden centres. If you can't see it, ask. Um, and so what I'm doing is I'm filling this up, and I'm going to often you know if you've got if you make your own compost at home, you can mix that in. Um, if you're doing that then you'll understand whether it's kind of too heavy or too moist but homemade compost obviously has a lot of nutrients in it um it's a really good thing to to get on with um and i'm also because of what i'm planting um which is an agapanthus i'm going to mix in some horticultural grit and this improves drainage so if you are planting those more mediterranean plants things like rosemary uh, lavender if you're planting an olive tree if you're planting something that um, requires a little more free draining and you're worried you can't get that mixing in some sand or some grit will provide better drainage less likely to get waterlogged plants so what we've got here are anemone decayen they are they're actually a very meaningful plant to me. They're my grandmother's favourite and they are so beautiful and bright. Um, anemones you can encourage to force in the spring, in the kind of time we're here now, and you can grow them inside in pots. But you can also grow them outside um, in the summer, which is what I intend to do. And so, as I was saying, with this pot, um, that I had bulbs and then I had kind of top level interest plants, it's exactly the same here. Planting um, things at different layers that bloom at different times means that you won't be, you can literally plant and go. You can plant at one container, leave it for about six months with really very little maintenance, as long as it's not in a rain shadow. And, and um, rain shadow being an area of your garden that doesn't get direct rainfall. So we've filled this up now and pop it on here. So you can hopefully say, see better what I'm doing. If um, you can do this with bulb lasagnas as well, with spring bulbs, and sometimes it helps to stick a ruler in the side or a tape measure and then mark with marker pen um, what you can, you know, kind of the levels of planting. But that's all, frankly, a bit too scientific for me. Um, with summer bulbs, you can plant ranunculus now, you can plant anemones now, lots of lilies, crocosmia. Lots of really exciting, bright, colourful things uh, that will bloom later in the summer. It's a good time to get those in, and any of those would work in this situation. Um, anemone corns are kind of funny, knobbly little things. Uh, and, you know, sometimes, often bulbs will have a root at the bottom and a sprout at the top. Not so with these, just pop them in. I'm burying them just actually under the top of this surface, and then I will fill that up with more soil. And I am putting them around the edge of the pot. And I think especially with the smaller flowers uh, and smaller flower bulbs, things that, you know, you want to go for impact. So don't be shy with putting these in. As long as they're not touching, um, I fill that up. So there's 15 in there. And I'm going to pop the other bag in as well. Let's see what people are uh, asking. Would you use polythione as crocs, John? Yes. In fact, that's reminded me of something I forgot to say. Especially when I was gardening on a balcony, you've got to think about weight quite carefully. And um, and polythione is a, a spit, uh, you know, if you out of shot but just below the camera. I've got two really tall dolly tubs that are about. 80 centimeters high if you're dealing with really really big pots and you're growing things that don't have a massive root base you can kind of cheat the amount of soil you put in by putting polystyrene in at the bottom it's quite a good way of filling that space especially if you're not if you don't have masses of compost so yeah thank you for raising that <laughs> it's a really good point so we are nearly done with our anemones as i say you can stick lilies in here ranunculus um any summer flowering bulbs cocosmias um foxtails all sorts of things that will be looking amazing in june july august can go in a pot now um so then i'll show you you can see all the bulbs hanging out there roughly in two concentric circles cover those up with another layer of compost and then it's putting my main event in so this is an agapanthus 
if you're not familiar with them, they have these incredible blue flowers. They hail from the Southern Hemisphere, so they're great if you've got a really sunny spot. And if you look at that, that root system is beautiful. If you're the type who feels a bit brave when you're looking for plants in nurseries or flower markets or garden centres or B&Q, um, always try and take a little look at the roots. You want a big, clean, white root um, because that means it's oxygenating and it's also not too tightly packed into the bottom of the pot. So um, obviously I've left a gap in the middle where I haven't put any anemone bulbs, but uh, I'm making a little bit of space for this. If the roots were very tightly packed, don't be afraid to pinch them out a little bit, help them settle in a bit better. Just pushing that so that the top of the plant is kind of just a couple of centimeters below the edge, and that is because we're going to fill in around the edge as well. Um, this agapanthus will in time get quite big. They are really pot friendly plants, not least because if you get a variety that isn't fully hardy, you'll want to bring that inside to a conservatory or a warm spot over winter because otherwise it can freeze. Um, and then, so this is going to look, the, the anemones should come up kind of early summer this will be flowering late summer and then the question is well this is fine but it looks a little unimaginative on a patio especially if you've got limited space you want all of those pots to work really hard which is when kind of the daintier annuals come in so um these are really beautiful little viola plugs um and i love violas actually they look amazing in Winter, I've got a few just out of shot all over my spring bulb pots here. Um, they look great in winter when it's really dark and miserable and you just really want that pop of colour. But then you can also keep them going through spring and summer. Main thing with violas is they don't like drying out. Um, so just make sure that if they are in a pot, they're kept relatively well watered, which is difficult when we're having as dry in April as this one. Um, People are asking about agapanthus. Yes, Vicky, this is what I'm doing, adding some small plants. <laughs> it's always like you knew what I was up to. Um, so yes, you can add smaller plants around. And, and again, I know that we're filling the space, but don't be tempted to cram too much in, especially if there are plants and bulbs underneath, because they will push them out of the way. Um, and I'll show you how we top dress this to sort of cover up any gaps. Um, compost to grow dahlias and you'll want something that's quite nutrient rich, you want something peat free. Um, so anything that's got quite a lot of organic matter in will be, will be pretty good for that. Uh, how many litres? Oh gosh, I don't really work very well in litres, but for centimetres wide, I'd say you want to aim for something that's at least 40 centimetres wide. So I've planted six little violas. I'm not a terribly symmetrical person in general, but I do think when it comes to planting this kind of thing that it benefits from having some level of symmetry. If that's not your vibe, whatever you want. Um, as I was saying, it's important to water these things in well. So when this isn't on the chair I'm about to sit down on, I will give it a really good drink. But um, in the meantime, I'm just going to top dress it with grit. This is the same grit that I mixed into the compost. And there are a couple of reasons for this. One, it looks nice. Um, two, it um, retain, helps retain water. And three, which is my favourite reason, it keeps the squirrels from digging everything out. It's really important around here because not much lasts long if you don't. Um, wire netting, as uh, Hazel's asked, it will, I mean, it will help keep birds and squirrels off if you have some. I've also um, in the past, what I've done is I've laid a layer of, um, of chicken wire, but if you're planting spring bulbs in like autumn or something, you layer a layer of chicken wire above uh, your bulbs and then you um, cover with compost and then you can put grit on that as well and that really does keep them off but it's a bit of a faff to, 
also be chopping and changing when you do want when you've got that chicken wire there. Um, someone was asking about spring bulbs, and it's a really good question because we're at the time when our spring bulbs are going over. I'm kind of amazed that the daffodils have lasted that long, but it's a sign of how cold the spring has been. Um, there's a few options for spring bulbs. So if they're in your bed, as in like in the ground, and you're happy with them, so that is all covered with grit now. And as you can see, it's, it's looking quite nice. I'm going to give, give it a good drink later. But the violas will grow over the edge and provide interest. As long as you keep deadheading them and feeding them, they'll look great. And meanwhile, the agapanthus will get bigger. And then in a couple of months, we're going to start seeing the anemones poke through. And that should keep nice until the autumn when this one comes through. And you can do that in several places in your patio. And it's sort of just job done, really. Uh, spring bulbs. So these are looking great now. What happens when they start to go over? So I keep mine in place mostly. Um, mostly because I plant up planters that have enough space to be perennial. So every year I'll deadhead the flowers, that sends the energy back into the bulb and I keep all the leaves going because while they're green they're feeding the bulb that means more energy to bring the spring flower back next year what i don't do is lift them in those bigger pots because there's enough room for them in there and every autumn and late spring i will mulch my pots with compost which feeds everything in the pot it's kind of a self-contained medium however in smaller pots something like this um which has had some lovely irises in. This is now looking a bit tatty and this will hold pelagoniums that I've been overwintering for the rest of summer. So with these, this is where I try and do a demo and it's not quite <laughs> moist enough. I will lift the bulbs and um, store them uh, in a brown paper bag and the cupboard under the stairs or maybe the shed, somewhere where they're not gonna get discovered by mice, basically. Um, store them until the autumn when I'll plant them out again so you can do that if they're in the beds just leave them be deadhead them leave them be and yes the greenery looks a bit scruffy but the minute it starts going yellow it's not serving that bulb anymore so you can cut it off just yeah um, what do I feed my violas asks Ian I use an organic seaweed mixture so that's maxi crop seaweed feed fertilizer I use that on everything inside and out and I use that normally until solstice, which is 21st of June, because that encourages leafy growth. And then for, for the rest of summer, I use something more like a tomato feed, which is high in potassium. And that encourages fruit and flowers. So if you want fruit and flowers, you want a more potassium rich feed. Um, is bark good to put on top? Theresa asks, you know, I've not tried it, but it does look nice. Um, it's really a case of whether it will stop um, the squirrels are not in my interests. Uh, it's worth a try. Like many things in gardening, it's worth a try. Oh my goodness, I'm so overwhelmed by all the questions. Um, Anne, Anne's asking about cash pots. What's their function? It's a really good one. So, a cash pot is often you'll get a plant, is some ivy here, and it arrives in a plastic nursery pot. And um, if you're inside the house or even outside, um, you might want to put this into a, a kind of ceramic, a better looking pot, which might not have a hole in the bottom. Um, now, this is a situation whereby the outside pot looks great, but when you water this, all of that water is going to hang out in the bottom of the ceramic pot and not go anywhere. So if inside it's not such a big deal, you can take it out, take it under the sink, water it, put it back in. Outside you've got to keep an eye on because if we've had a lot of heavy rain, you can end up with a build up of water. But there is also a genius cash pot solution, which is I've got a number of, um, might be able to see, yeah, chimney pots uh, in the garden as planters. And what I have on top of those, because, you know, going back to this, a lot of space and a lot of gravity, and they don't actually have a bottom because they're a chimney pot. I've put a, a plastic pot inside each of my chimney pots, which means that every season I can just lift it out and swap it in for another seasonal plant at the moment. That's got some ferns and some miniature narcissi in. They're still looking good, but in a few weeks they might have gone over. 
So then I can lift that out. I'll probably leave the ferns in there, to be honest, but I could put pelargoniums, nasturtiums, any of my summer annuals, I could be putting back into that cash pot. Um, when plant, so Hannah's asked a question, when planting mixed containers, such as ferns with tulips, like this, do they all have to be planted in one go? No. So, oh, I don't know what happens if I click the answer live button, but yes, um, you don't. And what this might, you know, today, obviously today I've done that, but come the autumn, say some of my, I'm sitting next to these enormous sweet pea containers right now. Those sweet peas will be going over at exactly the right time for me to put tulips in. And so it's just a case of popping them, put the tulips in. You know, you can use a trowel or a dibber, or maybe I use a Japanese knife called a hori hori, which is amazing for a lot of things in the garden. But no, you can layer things up. Similarly, if some of your containers say, some plants in them get frosted, if they, you know, they've just reached the end of their life. If they have annuals and they've gone to seed, you can whip those out, put something else in. It's a nice opportunity at that moment to mulch your containers as well and give them a bit of a feed and a water. Um, but yeah, no, it doesn't all have to be done at the same time. If your container's big enough, you can swap and change. It's all good. Um, my Kate's anemones are flowering now. Yes, so if you did plant them in January, February time, early in the spring, they will come through. These I expect, maybe the end of May. I mean, this spring is so weird. <laughs> um, who who knows? Um, but yeah, early summer. Was I tamping the compost down at all? Asks Judith. Um, the thing with containers is that actually everything gets a bit compact in there. By the time you put extra plants and grit and everything else and it's getting quite tense. So no, for those who don't know, tamping down is something um, that happened that is the process of push pressurizing the soil to um get rid of any kind of air pockets or you know space essentially and it's it's quite important when you're planting seeds because you really want nice snug texture for the new roots to to form in so i didn't tamp down this um because often i find container compost gets quite compacted um Will, when will it be safe, asks Felicity, to transplant my ranunculus young plants into the garden? Um, now, ranunculus is quite hardy. So I think depending on where you are in the country, um, certainly in the next week to the next couple of weeks, depending on your frost level, you should be OK because they are they are quite hardy. Um, but I don't know where you are and how frosty it is up there at the moment. To be on the safe side, I'd wait until the frost risk has passed. And I'd also um, be conscious of how my kind of, because we don't get much frost right here, um, I'd be really aware of um, slugs. <laughs> when I've been planting out my hardy annuals, I have been putting out some to see if the slugs get them or not, and then, and then going from there. On slugs and snails, I know that I've not talked about them, and, and in containers, we also, we've got them to think about we've also got vine weave to think about and i'm going to answer them all with the same solution which is nematodes so i vine weave was if you've not encountered them really sneaky pests they look quite kind of like prehistoric beetles if you see them in the day but they generally operate at night the best way to tell you've got them is the munch kind of uh you know the very hungry caterpillar style munches out of leaves there's big kind of semicircular chomp marks and um the adults aren't too problematic, but they their larvae um, eat the roots uh, of container plants. They're particularly container plant prone. So the way I deal with them is with nematodes. And when it warms up a little, um, it's kind of around normally from this sort of time on through the summer, but really late spring, early summer, I apply nematodes. And they're a biological control, so they're organic. And they're essentially a microscopic worm that acts as a parasite. They're brilliant because they don't affect any of the other wildlife in your plants and your compost mix. And I use nematode treatment on my flower beds for slugs as well. They kill the young slugs um, in the theory that you shouldn't get any more. We hope. Um, you know, slug treatments are, are as old as time. There's a million different ways to them. Another very effective organic way of getting rid of them is having a pond which encourages frogs to eat your slugs um, and going back to the, you know what I was saying about starting off with good um, 
compost and, and happy plants and you know really think about what you're planting your plants into and how well you're watering in because a healthy plant will resist pests better we are running out of time it's gone remarkably quickly i've got a few minutes left um and um oh hopefully can i've answered your question how lucky that you've got a hedgehog um so yeah if you don't want to eradicate slugs and snails hopefully your hedgehog will do the work for you um and just having a look i've got lots of um yeah so i think i'm probably a final kind of closing marks then on patio and container gardening um get the biggest pots you can afford fill them with the best compost you can get and think beyond just the instant. So if you see something very beautiful in a, in a garden centre uh, now, that's great. Um, but think of them as kind of filler for now, or unless they're a perennial, in which case, great. And think more about what kind of plant that will look good in a few months' time. So embrace bulbs, um, embrace uh, kind of larger perennials, and give everything a bit of space. Um, don't forget to top dress with gravel um, and with those spring bulbs just deadhead them when they're gone and leave them be let them work their way down um, plant for the areas that your environment creates so if you are very sun soaked if you are very windswept think about hot drought resistant wind tolerant plants um, and if you have shady quite damp uh, dark conditions embrace woodland planting um, which can be so beautiful <laughs> um, we did have one question about year-round color which i'm really conscious i haven't got to and for that i would say heucheras which are a foliage based plant but do actually have amazing flower spires which don't take a lot of sunshine to, to turn up and they come their leaves come in every color of the rainbow pretty much everything from kind of very soft pale orange all the way to a deep and dark purple with lots of greens in between and heuchera is um actually mine mine are hardy and and present all year round and so that's a brilliant way of bringing color and interest in all year round without relying on flowers so this has been a delight thank you so much for all your questions and your enthusiasm um i'm sure your patios are going to be gorgeous it's been a real treat to have you along thank you for watching